Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Live with Lon. It's so great to be with you today. And uh, I'm very excited about what we're going to share today. And I hope uh, that you will put your thinking caps on and get out your pencils and uh, you can do some follow-up work on this after I preach it because I'm not going to be able to give you every detail and, and, and you may want to uh, go and do some work on the, on the internet, on Google and everything. But we've got an exciting topic today. We're going to talk about the mantra that I use in Israel with all my tour groups. And I'm sure you've heard it before. It's the mantra, the more they dig out of the ground, the more the Bible proves to be right. The, say it with me. The more, come on, they dig out of the ground, the more the Bible proves to be right. Here we go. And that's what we're going to talk about today from John chapter 9. So, let's pray, and we're going to dig in, baby. Let's go. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for giving us the Bible, the Word of God, Thank you, Lord, for its reliability and for the fact that, indeed, the more they dig out of the ground, the more the Bible stands the test of correctness and accuracy. So, Lord Jesus, we commit our time to you now. Strengthen our walk with God by strengthening our confidence in the veracity of the Scripture and we pray this in Jesus' name, and everybody said, what? Amen. And what? Amen. You got it. Now, what do we study here at Live with Lawn? Say it with me. We study what? The Bible. Come on. The whole Bible, right? Nothing but the Bible. And then we apply it to our life. But the basis upon which we do this is the conviction that the Bible is true, that it is trustworthy, that it is reliable, that it has veracity. And if the Bible doesn't, um, I mean, we might as well just take it and throw it in the trash can and be as lost and as directionless as the whole rest of the world. But I'm going to give you proof today uh, that the Bible has stood test after test after test. We're in John chapter 9 today, one of my very favorite chapters in the Bible, because I love the man in this chapter, and I love his logic, and I love his intellectual honesty in front of all the rabbis, and I love his courage. He's not intimidated by them at all, and he's even got a little chili pepper down in his tummy where he resists these rabbis and and actually contends back with them. I love this guy. So let's look. Here we go. John chapter 9. And yes, my good friend Jack Sternberg in Hot Springs, Arkansas, we are finally out of John chapter 8. <laughs> but you... You may be frustrated how long we spent in John chapter 9, brother. <laughs> okay, New King James Version of the Bible. Here we go. John chapter 9, verse 1. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind. And Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Now, we covered this last week, and I hope you heard that message, because if you didn't, you need to listen to it. And what we saw was that, yes, sometimes egregious sin is why uh, something uh, tragic or unfortunate befalls us because God is trying to put a hook in our nose and turn us back around like the prodigal son. However, 
what we saw last week in our message is that so often tragedy, trouble, uh, uh, disability, sickness, whatever comes into our life to provide God a platform to display and put on public appearance. Couldn't think of another word for display. <laughs> but on public display, his power, his omnipotence, his majesty. Having said that, let's move on. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, says Jesus. The night is coming where no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and he said to, the, to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went his way and washed. Now I want to stop there because I want us to talk for a minute about the pool of Siloam. There are two significant pools mentioned in the Bible. The pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5 and the pool of Siloam in John chapter 9. These are not the same pools. They are quite a distance apart. And today we have the mention of this pool, the pool of Siloam. Now, where is this pool? Well, archaeologists have just a few years ago discovered the true pool of Siloam. Let me show you an artist's rendition of what we think it looked like. Very beautiful steps down into the pool. And let me show you today a slide of what it looks like as it is being archaeologically excavated. The Pool of Siloam was in the southern part of the old city of David, the old city of Jerusalem at the time of Jesus. And it was, we know now, it was a place where pilgrims stopped and washed and then there was a paved road that we have just uncovered, archaeologists have, that goes directly there up the hill and to the Temple Mount. So pilgrims would wash, they would walk this paved road up to the Temple Mount, and then they would enter there and they would sacrifice and worship. Okay. Now, at the time of Jesus, this pool had been in place for 800 years. Originally, this pool was not put there for ceremonial purification or for ritual purposes. It was put there to be a source of water for the city of David uh, way back in the 8th century. And it was dug by King Hezekiah, and the reason he dug it is because he knew that King Sennacherib, you say who? Blah, 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 blah. King Sennacherib, he's in the Bible. You can find the record of this in 2 Kings 18 and 19, write that down, 2 Chronicles 32, and Isaiah 36, 37, and 38. 2 Kings 18 and 19, 2 Chronicles 32, and Isaiah 36, 37, and 38. King Hezekiah of the nation of Assyria was invading the land of Judah. And the northern kingdom was already gone by this point. This was 701 BC. The northern kingdom had been conquered by one of Sennacherib's predecessors in 721 BC, 20 years before. But now Sennacherib moves upon the remaining 
Jews living in Jude, the, the, the nation of Judah. And Hezekiah, knowing that he was coming, Sennacherib, he understood that when your city is surrounded and besieged, uh, you may need food, but you need more than food. The most important thing you need is what? You need water. And so Hezekiah dug, had a tug, tunnel dug underground through solid rock from a natural spring, stick with me here, outside of the city walls of Jerusalem. Under the city wall, the tunnel went through solid rock and ended up inside the city wall at the pool of Siloam. He then put a artificial covering, an artificial mound over the spring made out of dirt, uh, reinforced dirt, so that the spring continued to flow down the tunnel and into the city of Jerusalem. But people outside the city had no idea that the spring was there. It was under all this dirt in a hollow cavern under the dirt. And so I'm sure that the Assyrians were like, where are these people getting all their water from? Well, it was through this tunnel that Hezekiah had dug under the city wall through solid rock, and I'll talk more to you about that in a moment, into the pool of Siloam inside the city, and this supplied water for the city. This was 701 B.C. As I'll tell you in a minute, it's an amazing engineering feat that you can still walk through today uh, if you go to... Uh, Israel with me. Uh, and and the final thing I want to say about it, it is mentioned in the Bible, this tunnel, in 2 Kings 20, verse 20. That's easy to remember. 2 Kings 20, 20, and 2 Chronicles 32, where it mentions the tunnel that Hezekiah had dug from the Gihon Spring outside the city wall into the pool of Siloam. All right, you with me? Now, we're going to stop here for a moment because the finding of this pool a few years ago confirms this comment in the Bible that Hezekiah dug this tunnel. They dug it out of the ground, and sure enough, the, 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 the tunnel, which is still there, empties into this pool inside the city wall, just as the Bible says. And what I want to do now is I want to give you, want to stop for a moment and give you a bunch of other archaeological discoveries that similarly confirm statements in the Bible or narrative in the Bible. Now, why am I doing this? Let me tell you. The Bible is a supernatural book written supernaturally by a supernatural God. We can't confirm the miracles in the Bible. We can't confirm the spiritual truth in the Bible, like the fact in John 8 that Jesus said, he who believes in me has eternal life. Well, the only way to confirm that is to die and find out. And then, you know, <laughs> nobody's coming back to tell us except the Lord Jesus himself who rose from the dead. So uh, we can't confirm those things empirically with a slide rule. Of course, nobody knows what a slide rule. With a computer uh, or, or an adding machine. But there are many references in the Bible to historical events, chronologically historical events that the Bible claims happened in time and space, which we can subject to a thorough examination. And here is our logic, okay? Follow me now. If the Bible proves to be true, in the areas of history and chronology 
And it's not meant to be a history book. It's meant to be a salvation book. So, nonetheless, if the Bible is correct when it says something historically happened and we find out indeed it did happen, that means that we can, by extrapolation, assume that it's also correct in what it says spiritually about eternal life and the plan of salvation because it's a spiritual book. History was not even the reason it was written, but if it's correct when it comes to history, which is a secondary issue in the Bible, then the primary issue in the Bible, salvation, eternal life, forgiveness of sin, should be true as well. Do you follow me? Okay. Now, let me show you these archaeological discoveries proving that the more we dig out of the ground, the more the Bible proves to be right. I've only picked a few. So uh, there are more. But you got to keep up with me now. And they're in no particular order. They're just in the order I think of them. All right, let's begin. King Hezekiah, let's talk about him since we're here. There are two great discoveries that, uh, that confirm what the Bible says about him is true. First, we've got Hezekiah's tunnel, and we've got the inscription on Hezekiah's tunnel. Let me show you a picture of it. It's cracked, as you can see, because it was on the wall of this tunnel uh, after they completed it, digging from two ends like the Transcontinental Railroad when they met in the middle, they put this commemorative plaque that they inscribed on the wall of the tunnel. It was chiseled off uh, by some local Arab boys and sold. And it gives the, the um, uh, narrative of this tunnel being dug. It talks about how the two groups started and chiseled and finally met in the middle. Uh, the original is in the Istanbul Archaeological Museum. I've had the great privilege of seeing it. And what you're seeing is a picture of it right now, describing the digging of the very tunnel the Bible talks about. And also, when it comes to Hezekiah, let me show you this little bula that we just found several years ago. It's a little round. You see it? It's about a centimeter in uh, width, and what a bula was is, uh, you know how in, all, in the old days in letters they would put wax on the back and they'd stamp it with a seal and it would make the seal of the king or whatever and be a proof of authenticity and of authorship? Well, this is what a bula is, made out of clay, and we, have, we found one in a trash dump of all places in the southern part of Jerusalem, and when stamped into a piece of wax, it reads, Of Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah. Hezekiah himself, this was one of his, one of his stamps. His name, we found it. Just like the Bible says, did this guy really exist? Of course he did. We found his bula that he stamped wax with. Of course he lived. He wasn't a mythical uh, a, a person that somebody made up. Now, let's move on. Speaking of mythical people that somebody made up, this is, was the common liberal view of David and Solomon, uh, that David was a mythical person like Hercules, who uh, the Jewish people made up because of they needed an etiology. They needed a a history. Uh, so they made up a mythical hero like David and, and Solomon and their great kingdom. Uh, but it was all it was all fraudulent. That is until we found, I'll show you a picture of the Tel Dan Stila. Uh, the Tel Dan Stila was found in the northern part of Israel in Tel, meaning a hill with many civilizations in layers. Tel Dan 
the city of Dan up in northern Israel. It was found in 1993 by archaeologists, and the picture we're showing you has the name of David highlighted in the silver paint. Do you, you see that? This is the first mention of the name of David outside of the Bible uh, that's not connected to the Bible. And Josephus, the great historian, wrote about David, but he got all his information out the Bible, so that doesn't count. This is an inscription by King Hazael of Syria, not Assyria, of Syria, about a battle that he fought with the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom and a battle he won. Uh, and he talks about the king of the southern kingdom being the son of David, the son of David. This guy didn't read the Bible. He knew nothing about the Bible, but he knew that David was a real person, that the king of Judah that he was fighting was descended from. David was not now, we know, some mythical creature. He was a real person that really lived thanks to the Tel Dan Stila. Let's move on. I've got a lot of these for you today. How about the Moabite stone? Let's show you a picture of it. Here's a stone found in 1868 uh, that is written by Misha, the king of the Moabites, in which he commemorates his revolt against the king of Israel, the northern kingdom, and his victory against the king of Israel, this is mentioned in the Bible, 2 Kings chapter 3, uh, although there it's written from the perspective of the king of Israel, but they both agree that there was this conflict between Israel and Moab, Moab here in the years that the northern kingdom existed. And by the way, this stone also has the first mention of Yahweh, the four letters, the tetragrammaton, yod hey vav hey, Yahweh, and found anywhere outside of the Bible as the God of Israel. Praise the Lord. How about another one? Uh, here, is a, here is the Cyrus cylinder. And this is a cylinder uh, that we found in 1879, uh, written by uh, uh, the scribes of Cyrus the Great, who was the Persian ruler that captured Babylon after Nebuchadnezzar died. And this cylinder tells how he made an edict that the Jews could return to their own land and reestablish their form of worship. Not just the Jews, his exiles in general, but certainly the Jews, this corresponds perfectly with the end of the Babylonian captivity as recorded in the book of Ezra and with the comment in Isaiah chapter 45 about Cyrus, God says, my servant who will do this. Hey, one more thing back to Hezekiah. Here's Hezekiah's prism. Let's put it up. On this prism, Hezekiah records all of his uh, wonderful conquest, and in this prism, he says, he mentions Hezekiah, and he says he shut up Hezekiah like a bird in a cage, but he never says here on this prism that he conquered Jerusalem, because he never did. If you read the account, 185,000 of his soldiers were killed in one night by angels from the Lord, and God said he put a hook in his nose and turned Sennacherib back home again, and he never did conquer Jerusalem. In the prism, he talks about all the other cities and nations that he conquered, but he never says he conquered Jerusalem. Why? Because just like the Bible says, he didn't. All right, let's go on. Let's talk about the Babylonian Chronicles. We'll put a picture of that up on the stage, uh, on the stage, <laughs> on the screen, okay? And here in the Babylonian Chronicles, presently in the uh, uh, British Museum, uh, the, 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 uh, the tablet covers the year 604 to 594 BC and talks about how Nebuchadnezzar, 
captured the city of Jerusalem, how he deported the then ruler Jehoiachin, and how he set up another puppet ruler, Zedekiah, whom the Bible names these two people, just like this Babylonian chronicle names them. And this was the, the uh, second capture. Jerusalem was captured by Nebuchadnezzar three times, 606, 596, and 586. This was the middle capture uh, that he is recorded here in the Chronicle of Babylonia. And you know what? After the Jews revolted against him the first time, the second time, finally he said, all right, I'm through dealing with these people. I'm just going to destroy the city, which is what he did the third time. He took the city in 586 B.C. Hey, I already talked to you about the Siloam inscription, so let's move on. Uh, let me show you something from the New Testament. This is the Delphi inscription found at Delphi in Greece, and it's an amazing confirmation of, of, the, of the book of Acts. Paul says in the book of Acts that while he was living in Corinth, here's the actual quote, he says that when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack upon Paul. This is what Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, says. Now, here in the Delphi inscription, we have Gallio mentioned by name and mentioned as the proconsul of Achaia, and also we are told that it was a one-year appointment for him, and he was there in 51 to 52 AD. So we have an exact dating of when this happened when Paul was in Corinth and Gallio was the proconsul exactly the way the book of Acts says. How about the Jerusalem temple warning? Let me show you a picture of that. This is a uh, inscription found near the temple mount in Jerusalem. It was found in 1871. It's now in the Istanbul Archaeological Museum. And it reads, let me quote to you what it reads. It reads, no foreigner is to enter within the railing and the enclosure around the temple. Whoever is caught will be responsible himself for his subsequent death. You remember in Acts chapter 21, where the Bible says the Jews, there was a massive revolt and an attempt to kill Paul. Why? Because the Bible says people thought that he had brought Trophimus, a Gentile, onto the Temple Mount, and they were going to kill him. Here we have evidence that indeed this was the rule, and this is what the Jews were doing when they were trying to kill the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 21. Let me give you another one. How about the Pontius Pilate inscription? Let's put a picture of it up. Here we have a, an inscription uh, found in Caesarea in 1961 that contains the name of Pontius Pilate. Many people had said Pilate perhaps was a made-up person uh, that was just, you know, the arch enemy like a, of Jesus, like uh, uh, Batman has the Joker type thing. No, no, he was a real person. His name appears uh, right here on this inscription. Uh, the end of the word Pontius and the word, Pi word Pilatus exists right here on this stone. It's in the Israeli Museum. And if you ever go to Israel with me, I'll show it to you. And if the guard's not looking, you can touch it. <laughs> okay, something else that's in the museum is the leg bone, the ankle bone of this crucified man. Let me show it to you. You'll see it here, was discovered, of course, in Jerusalem in 1968. And look at the nail through his ankle. It's bent, the nail is. Uh, but now we know that crucifixion indeed was being practiced in the Holy Land uh, by the Romans because we have an ankle of a man uh, who was crucified. And, uh, the, the difference here is that this man clearly had his two feet on the sides of the cross, not crossed in the middle 
uh, as the crucifix shows, but on the side, and they drove a nail through each ankle into the side of the cross. Does that make a difference in our redemption? No. Jesus is nailed to the cross one way versus another. It doesn't matter, but it does give us confirmation that crucifixion was indeed practiced, just as the New Testament says. Now, let me give you just a couple others uh, while I'm thinking about it. Uh, let me show you a picture of the Dead Sea Scrolls, found uh, the first ones, first ones found in 1947, which have uh, uh, confirmed uh, the, the accuracy of the Old Testament and its cop it's, uh, how the copyists were true to the text for hundreds of years, uh, from the Dead Sea Scrolls to the oldest copy we have of the Old Testament, the Aleppo Codex, from the 970s A.D., a thousand years, and the texts are virtually identical. Uh, there are small word differences like and and the, but nothing of any significance whatsoever. A thousand years of the transmission of the Old Testament, and it is almost flawless, giving us confidence in the seriousness which with, with which the Jewish people transmitted uh, the text of the Bible. Now, I'll show you uh, one or two more things. Let me show you the, the Pool of Bethesda. And the Pool of Bethesda, uh, we have dug up, and the Bible says it had five porches, and when we dug it up, guess how many porticos, how many porches we found? Take a guess. Five, just like the Bible said. The more they dig out of the ground, the more Bible foods be true. I got one more for you. These little silver amulets were found by accident when a, they had a backhoe digging the foundation of, for a new building. They were found in a tomb in Chetef Kinom, and, um, and, and, and it took them three years because the silver, uh, an amulet's like a charm that would go on a, a stick, a, 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 a piece of rawhide that you'd put around your neck or maybe around your ankle or your wrist. And it took them three years to unroll it because the silver was so uh, uh, hard to work with. It was so old. When they finally unrolled it, it was inscribed with the high priestly prayer from Numbers chapter 6. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord uh, uh, cause his, count uh, his, his countenance to shine upon you and may give you peace. And these are dated to 650 to 700 B.C. Why are these important? Well, they're the oldest biblical inscription we have anywhere in the world. But more than that, the liberal scholars who don't believe Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, including the book of Numbers, uh, they attribute this the, the priestly books, the books of Numbers and some of Leviticus, to being after the exile. Uh, to Babylon after the Jews returned uh, in the early 500s B.C. and 400s B.C. Now suddenly we have an inscription from the priestly section, number six, 250 years before liberal scholars say the books were even written where, the, where, where this prayer was. And certainly this wasn't a brand new prayer. You don't take a brand new prayer and put it on a, a charm bracelet. This prayer had been around for centuries. All the liberals will grant is that maybe this indeed was an older prayer that got worked into the priestly books in the 400s. No, this is telling us that the first five books of the Bible are hundreds and hundreds of years older then minimalist literal scholars will credit it for being. And indeed, as I believe, Moses wrote all five books of the Bible. And we know that writing was in existence from 3000 BC. And the Hebrew, Proto-Hebrew, the early Hebrew language, we have an inscription from a turquoise mine in Sarabit el Kadim in the Sinai from 1500 BC. Could Moses have used Proto-Hebrew to write the first five books of the Bible? Yes, 
Was Moses educated enough to know how to write? For the first 40 years, raised as the son of Pharaoh, of course he was. And I could go on and on and on. You say, well, Lon, ah! we got the point. What's the point? Say it with me. The more they dig out of the ground, the more the Bible proves to be right. Now, let's ask our most important question, and we're done. Say it with me. Come on. One, two, three. So what? Yes. And as my buddy Jackie Gleason would say, come on. How sweet it is. Yes. What's the takeaway today? Friends, can we prove the Bible in all of its miracles and what it says about the plan of salvation? Can we prove it in a test tube? No. But if we can prove the parts of the Bible that are able to be proved, the historical parts, the chronological parts, the narrative parts, then it only makes sense that it's also dependable in the things we can't empirically prove. And I want to, I want to assure you, the Bible is telling you the truth. The Bible... You can depend on it. The Bible, there has never been an archaeological discovery that has convincingly disproved anything the Bible says. Now, there have been a couple of discoveries that scholars argue about what, it, what the discovery really means, but to have found an archaeological discovery that contradicts the Bible without any question... Never, never, and there never will be, because the Bible is telling us the truth. And that means it's not just telling us the truth about history and chronology. No, no. It's telling us the truth about how to get to heaven. It's telling us the truth about how to have our sins forgiven. It's telling us the truth about how to get eternal life. It's telling us the truth about who Jesus is and what he did for us on the cross. And you ride the Bible and what it says like a surfboard into eternity. And brother, sister, you will be glad you did because you will end up on the shores of heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you ride anything else into eternity. Your good works. You're being a nice person. You're trying to keep the Ten Commandments. You're saying the rosary. You're going to synagogue on Yom Kippur. Uh, 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 meditating, uh, your med praying five times to Mecca. Anything you ride into, into the eternity other than the word of God and what it teaches us about the plan of salvation. And my friend, sad as it is to tell you this, you're going to end up in hell for eternity in torment and anguish, as the Bible says. So you have a very important decision to make, my friend. Are you going to give up everything else you've ever trusted to get you into heaven and get you eternal life and embrace what the Bible says about Jesus paying for your sins on the cross with his blood plus nothing else? Are you going to do that? Or are you going to stick to the things that don't work? Let me tell you something. If you went into a room and there were 50 doors all claiming to lead to heaven, and standing by 49 of them were dead skeletons, and standing by one of them was a living, resurrected Christ, which one, which door would you take? Well, you'd be a fool if you didn't take the one with the living person there. And this is what Jesus said, because I live, you shall live, he said. Remember what we say, follow a dead Savior, you'll end up just like him. But we don't follow a dead Savior. The Bible tells us we follow a living Savior. And because he lives, we who follow him shall live also. Oh, my friends, this is the truth. Believe it. Trust it. Base your eternal destiny on it. And it will not let you down. Praise the Lord. 
Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for using archaeology today to confirm so many parts of the Bible that can be historically, chronologically confirmed. And help us, Lord, to remember that even though we can't confirm the spiritual parts of the Bible in a test tube or with an archaeological discovery, that, Lord, if the Bible is right about the things that it was not written primarily to tell us, history, chronology, then certainly it is correct about the primary thing it was written to tell us about, and that is salvation, eternal life, how to get to heaven. Help us believe it. And right now I want to lead you in a quick prayer. If you've never done this, pray after me, out loud or to yourself, Lord Jesus, today, I reject every other remedy that I have ever trusted to get me into heaven and give me eternal life. And I embrace today what the Bible tells me will work. Trusting the blood of Jesus shed on the cross as the payment for my sin in the sight of a holy God, plus nothing else, not my good works, not my religious activity, nothing. Lord, please accept my decision today and grant me eternal life the way you promised in the Scripture. He who believes in me, Jesus said, has eternal life. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said what? Amen. Okay. I hope you stuck with me through all of that. If not, go back, pause it, look up each one of these discoveries online. Google them. Read about them. Become a scholar. Uh, uh, of the of the Bible and know about these things in more detail and they will confirm your faith in a mighty way. God bless you and next week, Lord willing, we'll pick up in John 9 and we'll see what happened when the man went to the pool and washed in the pool the way Jesus told him. God bless you.